good to be here tonight. It is wonderful. I just feel the vibe in the room. Uh, just so much energy. I, I didn't think I'd be able to celebrate, celebrate my birthday. It was in March. <laughs> I'd forgotten that it even happened. So anyway, but thank you so much for having us. We're, this is the first team camp we've done. We were just thinking about five or six years. So we're good. We're ready. We've rested up and now we're ready uh, to get in there with the teens once again. So look forward to this great theme of unfiltered. Uh, that's going to happen tomorrow afternoon, so we look forward to it. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, we really feel your love and your generosity. Uh, real quick, just this is our family. We're in Edinburgh, Scotland. You can see we've uh, taken a dive right into the culture. Uh, we, we, we're just having a blast there. We've been there now uh, over three years. Uh, it's, we're into our fourth year, and it's a four-year mission there, so we've just a really good time. We're from Miami, Florida, so it could not be any more different. Yeah. Uh, but you really can't see as well in this picture, but rain is coming down. Oh, it is very, very Scottish in every way that you can think about. But we are able to serve a group of fantastic Christians. You have connections, I'm sure, with many of them in Edinburgh. This is one of our services at the beach, which we actually try to do there. And it does work sometimes in Scotland with the weather. But this is one of our recent times together on a Sunday. Just a wonderful group of people, and we really feel honored to be asked and called to go there and just uh, help rebuild the church and, and build on what's already been started there. And I really feel like it's heading in a very good direction to see what God is going to do. We've had uh, six of our teenage girls baptized in the last five years. Uh, in Glasgow and Edinburgh, and that may not sound like much, but when you consider each church is around 30 each, that's every girl that's of age has become a Christian wow. and is still faithful in those, in those churches. And you've seen Ella Brady, who now we just sent off as a one-year challenger to Manchester. So it's pretty encouraging when small little Edinburgh church yeah. can help strengthen big Manchester church wow. uh, with some of these great teens. We love our teens very, very much. There you see Ella and... We've had an influx of Americans. They've allowed us in. Uh, it wasn't just us and our family, but uh, we've had four Americans come and stay for a year and help with the church. And, and one of our goals there in Edinburgh has been to flip the demographic. Uh, we love our older Christians. I'm one of them. But it's a young city, and we want to represent our city. Uh, for Jesus, and so we've had young people come in and help, and they're bringing out young people, and uh, it's just been very, very exciting uh, to see that happen. We had our first wedding in the church wow. this May. It was our first wedding in Glasgow or Edinburgh among Christians in 12 years. Wow. So part of you goes, oh, wow, but also it's like, yes, <laughs> because you, you see biblically just all throughout Marriage is such a great celebration of something God gave us. And when you see Christians getting married and babies being born, good stuff is happening in the church. So we had our first proper Christian Scottish wedding uh, back in May uh, with Chris and Marlies. They literally tied the knot, uh, as you see there. My wife's now going to come up, and she's going to lead us into the lesson for tonight, and then I'll take it from there. Hi, everybody. It's great to be with you. And um, yeah, I'm going to share some things that I feel I've learned since being in Edinburgh and that God has put on my heart that um, relate to this topic. And what I want to say is when you make a big change, of course, which we did going from Miami to Edinburgh, but even if it's not an international move, even if it's a local move, a new job, etc., um, you have a lot of emotions about that type of decision. It, you know, some of you probably are, your children are getting older, they're going to they're gonna go off, and so it's exciting, but it's scary, what's going to happen, um, you're losing your comforts and searching for new places to find that joy and that comfort. And I can say, you know, when we came to Edinburgh over three years ago, Rightly so, I came with a lot of hopes for what we could do in the church, 
um, dreams that I had for the church and a, a desire to pass them on to the church. But I can tell you, it was very, very hard. It was hard um, to, to bring those hopes to them um, where they were at. It was hard just to adapt to the culture of Scotland, which, yeah, it is. It really couldn't be much more different than Miami, Florida. In every way, um, the church that you know we led in Miami was 500 people, and was 30. This, the you drove, you know, long, more like here, long distances, and there you step out your door and you see five people that you know, and it's you know tiny and just the scale, and so we were really adjusting to that, and the feeling of needing God was very new, new in a good way, not that I didn't feel like I needed God before, but it became very indispensable, it wasn't a thing I need, it was the only thing I have that can meet this need in me, and um, I really had to cling to God in that way, um, because I, I didn't have anything else, and um, in that time, I really felt directed by God to study out hope in a different, different and deeper way. I think I had studied many times and heard many lessons on faith. I had studied and heard many lessons on love, but there's three in the big three, faith, hope, and love, and I was kind of like, I think I need to do more with hope because I have hopes for this church and I honestly I'm I'm struggling to hold on to them while I help this group of people and I noticed with my children which you've seen them with for them with the move every day when they would pray at night they would say things that they hoped for. God, I hope that we can make a friend. I hope for a good day at school. I hope for mm -hmm. even a good night's sleep. Just, but it, they used this, this phrase, I hope for this, I hope for this. And I, I heard and I saw how they were treating God like a father by being very honest with him about what they wanted him to do in their life. But he wasn't on the hook. It wasn't like the next day they didn't ask for it or they were mad it didn't happen or they pulled back. They just kept saying what they hoped for. Mm -hmm. And I, I really saw how vulnerable that is because you are, in a way, expressing an element of doubt mm -hmm. by saying, I hope yeah. you'll do this for me, God. I hope you'll do this. Mm -hmm. And we have big faith in God. He is the creator of the universe. He's all-powerful. There's no question he can. But the feeling of hope is, will he? Yeah. Will he do this yeah. thing that I right. would really like to see happen? Help this child become a disciple. Help this marriage turn around. I hope for this, mm -hmm. and I have it. I have it in my mind what it, what it looks like when it happens. And so I, I could see that that's very vulnerable to be in a, in a relationship with God like that. And that for me, it become easy almost, in a way, if this makes sense, to protect God from his own decisions so they wouldn't hurt me. If I'm a little less specific in what I say, <laughs> then I won't feel so rejected or like I didn't like I had to wait and so I, I really thought man to hope for things with God in my relationship with God is going to take another level of vulnerability from me um, first Thessalonians 1 verse 3 the Bible refers to the endurance that is inspired by hope and I really concluded in this hard that is right now being in Edinburgh, but there will be hard, even if I'm somewhere else, there will be hard that will come. In order to endure those things, I have to have hope. I have to put my hope in God, and I have to have this relationship with God um, that, is, that is dynamic, and it's what's going to get me through the tough spots in Edinburgh. Um, I, I think that it launches imagination and creativity in your relationship with God, which is really fun. You, yeah. you just put it there for him, and maybe he'll do it, and maybe he'll do it fast, and 
maybe he'll do it slow, maybe he'll do it in a different way, and maybe not at all, but you get to have a relationship with him because you get to talk to him about the things you might like to see. And then you get to go through your day thinking, is this how he's gonna do it? Could it be here? And that really makes it fun, and that's, I think, how hope helps you to endure when it's hard, because rather than thinking it hasn't happened, it hasn't happened, you have hope, and so maybe it's this. Maybe it's through her. Maybe this is the one that I've prayed about. So now we've been there for over three years, and we've seen some some very cool things happen, some that, you know, present well in a slideshow, some that only we can really understand because yeah. it's a deep character thing that's changed or something like that. But it's been exciting and, and I feel in a way, as I share this with you, that um, it has really changed my life and it's a part of who I am and um, it's changed my relationship with God. But please continue to pray for us in the yeah. Edinburgh Church that we can hold on to hope and, and we will do the same for you. I mean, seeing all your young people go out is so exciting and it gives so much hope for the whole UK. The needs are very vast and that's probably part of the reason that many Americans have come to the UK. But to see the next generation be able to get inspired and know that the position has not been filled, there is plenty for them to do, is really exciting and I hope for that for for all your children. So, there's so many great things about hope, but proverbial wisdom tells us this, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. That's true, hope will make you sick. That's why we stop hoping, or we don't deal with hope, because it always involves waiting. And that's the primary reason I think we lose hope. Or we ignore hope. Hope makes you sick mentally, physically, spiritually. But hope does beat the alternative. No one wants to be hopeless. So if you hope for something, what do you do while you wait? Because we've done a lot of waiting in Edinburgh. Life there is much slower. And we've had to figure out, what do we do with this? We have all these hopes and we're trying to keep hope alive. What do you do while you wait? And one of the best answers that I've found in the Bible is in Jeremiah 32. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 32. What do you do while you wait? Ephesians 4, 4 says that it has the one hope as a foundational pillar of Christianity. One hope. Of course, it's part of the big three. Faith, hope, and love in 1 Corinthians 13. And then Colossians 1, 5 teaches that faith and love spring from hope. So hope is a big deal. Hope is something we must have, but it takes time. So what do you do while we wait? If you hope for something, what do you do? Let's learn from Jeremiah. We'll read Jeremiah 32, verse 6. Crazy story. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle, will come to you and say, Buy my field that is at Anathoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then Hanamel, my cousin, came to me in the court of the guard, in accordance with the word of the Lord, and said to me, Buy my field that is in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field at Anathoth from Hanamel, my cousin, and weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver, signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase containing the terms and conditions in the open copy, and I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Moriah, the son of Messiah, in the presence of Hanamel, my cousin, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of the purchase, in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. This is very, very official. I charged Baruch in all of their presence, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both the sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, put them in an earthenware vessel, that they may last a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Houses and fields and vineyards shall be bought again in this land. Real estate. (laughs) 
I cringe. My wife and I bought our first home. We thought it would be a starter home. We didn't have any kids yet. Our first home, we bought it in 2006. Now, there's something in real estate called the principle of anticipation. And what this is, is it, you anticipate whether this property is going to be worth something based on what's going to happen outside forces that could affect its value. Yeah. Right? The principle of anticipation. The real estate market crashed two years after we bought this small house. And our house was suddenly worth four times less than our mortgage, which we had barely paid on. We are swimming underwater. We did not anticipate this. So 587 BC in Jerusalem, Babylon now is the new world superpower. And you see in verse 2, Babylon has taken Jerusalem under siege. It's only a matter of time. Babylon has captured Judah, Benjamin. They're taking over, and now they have Jerusalem by the throat. They are squeezing them out of the capital city. So in less than a year's time, Jerusalem will be burned. Many of the people will be killed, and those that survive will be sent into exile to Babylon. So what happens in the middle of the siege is Jeremiah's cousin comes to visit him in jail. Now, it's not your typical jail. He's on house arrest. Because what Jeremiah had been doing is he had been protesting the war. He had come with the words of God as a prophet. He was like, don't do this. Don't fight. Don't make alliances with these other countries to fight Babylon. You will get crushed. Now, this was not a popular message, right? That does not raise the national fervor. You know, he's not waving the flag at this point. People are angry with him and, and they try to shut him up. So they put him on house arrest. But remember, Jeremiah keeps preaching. He's not a patriot. He's a prophet. So what happens is his cousin, and you may have people like this in your family when you go to a family reunion. There's a, you know, you, you run into an old family member and it's always this one guy that has this get rich quick scheme. You know, it's just like come to you. It's like, hey, I'm into this now and you got to get into this business with me. You just, just invest, you know, two grand here and we're going to make this happen. Well, this is what happens. Cousin Mel comes and he visits Jeremiah. He's like, this guy's crazy. He's gone bonkers. He's nuts. There's a sucker born every minute. And so what he does is he comes, he's like, I'm going to, you know, this is all falling apart. I'm going to sell the family property to Jeremiah. Yeah. I think he'll go for this. <laughs> so remember the principle of anticipation. No real estate expert would ever advise Jeremiah to buy this property. This is the absolute worst time to buy. Babylon basically owns this property. Their troops are camped on this property. Soon Israel will cease to exist as a country. So this is a dumb time to buy. There's no reason to believe this property is ever going to be worth anything ever again. But here's the stunner. Jeremiah buys the property. Signed, sealed, delivered, all these witnesses. It's like five verses of bring these people, do this, make two copies of it, put in a Swiss bank account, you know, this earthenware vessel. You know, we, we, gotta, we gotta do this, and we're gonna do it right, and everyone's gonna see it. Write this down, he tells the secretary. He makes probably the worst real estate investment ever. Why? This is verse eight, verses eight and nine. Jeremiah said, I knew it was the word of the Lord. So I bought the field. In verse 15, God said, Houses and fields and vineyards shall be bought again in this land. So God promises Jeremiah that someday in the future, it will be a seller's market in Jerusalem. So Jeremiah, he obeys, he doubles down on the promises of God. It's the same for us today. While you wait... You invest. 
while you're waiting and you have these hopes and these dreams and it's taking time and you're waiting, you're waiting, you keep investing. You keep on investing. That's the man or woman of God who lives for the kingdom of God. They keep investing. Even when the heart says, man, there's just no logical reason for optimism. You keep buying in with God. You know, maybe you're a, a parent in here and your child has grown up and wandered away from Jesus. You know, maybe it's your spouse or a family member or a good friend, a person you love is completely lost right now. And it's going to take a miracle. You're waiting. Maybe you're single and, man, just the thought, you know, I don't even want to think about marriage anymore. I'm tired of it. Hoping for that makes me sick. Maybe you're a new Christian. I don't know if we have some newer Christians in here. I know that term's all relative, five years, four years. But maybe you've become a Christian in the last couple of years and thought, well, well, I've given everything up for Jesus. I've changed my life. And things actually in some ways have gotten harder and more difficult and more complicated. It's, it's tough. Or you could be an older Christian. And, and you can get weary of waiting for a revival in your health. A revival in your career or your finances or a revival in the church. When is this going to happen? Whatever it is, yeah. keep hope alive. Mm -hmm. While you wait, mm -hmm. you keep investing in the promises of God. Mm -hmm. And remember, God does not work on our timelines. Mm -hmm. You know, one of our favorite scriptures is Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you. I have these great plans to give you a hope, to give you a future. That's verse 11. But verse 10 is, this is going to happen in 70 years. We conveniently leave out verse 10. I don't want to ruin the scripture for you. It's still great. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, and, and the you here in Jeremiah 29, 11, it's, it's a community. It's plural. So it's much bigger. It's more glorious than an individual wish list. This is God talking to his people that he's going to build something that's going to outlive us. We're going to have a legacy if we invest. Yeah. It's bigger and that's the context here in Jeremiah 32 is Jeremiah makes this enormous life decision at great personal cost mm -hmm. And he's doing this based on a promise that God will fulfill to a future generation after he's dead. Wow. You know, that challenges me. Am I making decisions of hope based on the long view of things in the church or in my family? Or are we making decisions based on what's going to make our life easier this week? Or what's going to make things easier in the church for the next six months? Yeah. Right? Hope tells you to buy in. Yeah. Hope tells us to put our money where our mouth is. So we invest for the same reason that Jeremiah did. We trust God. We stand on his promises. And that takes a head of flint and a heart of flesh. You, you stand on those promises and you keep hope alive and you keep investing. But then the real estate deal here is done, and Jeremiah is probably thinking, oh man, <laughs> what did I just do? Let's read here in verse 16. 32, 16. Jeremiah writes, after I'd given the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, I prayed to the Lord saying, ah, Lord God. It is you who made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You show steadfast love to thousands, repay the guilt of the fathers to the children after them. O oh, great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts, great in counsel, mighty indeed. Let's skip ahead here for time. Verse 24. Behold, the siege mounds have come up to the city to take it. And because of sword and famine and pestilence, the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans who are fighting against it. What you spoke has come to pass, and behold, you see it. And yet you, O Lord, have said to me, buy the field for money and get witnesses. 
though the city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. So what do you do while you wait? God expects you to invest, and then you pray. And then you repeat this over and over and over again. You invest, then you pray. And right here in verse 17, it's, ah, oh, Lord God. And ah oh, isn't really even a word. It's a groan. It's a cry from the soul. You know, Romans 8, 26 says, The Spirit himself intercedes for us with, with groans that words cannot express. That's what this is here. Hope is deeply spiritual. It's not wishy-washy. It goes beyond what words can express. You feel it. Oh, Lord God, what have I just done? Help me, God. And there's really not a day that goes by that Amy and I have not thought this or prayed this since we moved to Edinburgh. Just this, oh. You know, because we had really, really high hopes going to Edinburgh. And when we left, you know, we, our church sent us off in grand style, and there were lots of cheers, and we felt like heroes, and it was like, yeah, we're just going to go there, I know it's going to be hard, but we're going to do it, and, and, and just going to make all these disciples, and change the city, and raise the banner for Jesus. Man, we had high hopes. And we're fighting to keep those hopes alive. At times, it's been inspiring and fun. It's been the experience of a lifetime. But many times, it's just waiting. Waiting for the church to grow. Wondering, am I doing something wrong? You know, what, what's happening? It, it's, our hearts are sick. And I can think, you know, as the leader of my family, oh, Lord God, what have I done? What have I done to my family? And I took my kids away from the only life and culture they've ever known and with these big dreams and I thought they were going to see these big awesome things and man, what have I done? <laughs> the shame at times that you fight and the humiliation, just being hard on yourself. But see, that's the vulnerability of hope. When you hope for God to do things in very specific ways, and then you put yourself out there and people actually know what you're hoping about, you're putting yourself in a very vulnerable position. I feel very vulnerable over here. And I don't like it all the time. It's not comfortable. Instinctively, we don't want to look or feel vulnerable. We want to look successful and that we have things all together and respected and and we don't want to be vulnerable, and we don't think we need to be vulnerable, especially when we get older and wiser. We're supposed to be beyond this. But I do think that's the reason why many of us get stuck. We play it safe. And we live boring Christian lives. And all we have are old stories, old days. Because we don't want the vulnerability that comes with hope. It's a tough trade-off. Here we get to see Jeremiah's prayer journal. We can't go through all this. We're running out of time. But, I mean, he takes his doubts, his fears to God. He worships God's character. Wow. I mean, just go through this prayer. God knows all these things that Jeremiah is saying. Jeremiah needs to hear himself say these to God, as we do as well. And so at the end of the prayer, he praises God. He spends most of his time there praising God. Then he gets to the end of the prayer... And then that's when he tells God, this plan doesn't seem to make sense. The city is about to burn, and yet you're telling me to buy property here. I've just made the worst financial decision of my life. God, what are you doing? But see, that's a man holding on to hope. He's looking to God somehow to give him strength. So while we wait, we invest and we pray over and over again. So let's close this out. God answers. God answers here in verse 26. And as we read this, this is the last part we'll read. God answers Jeremiah. And if you listen, 
God could be speaking to you. I mean, that's what the word of God is, is right? It's, it, it speaks to the people at that time, but then we build a bridge. You know, while we wait, we, we invest, we pray, but then we struggle, and then God answers. And I want you to hear God speaking to you tonight. Jeremiah 32, verse 26. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Let's skip ahead to verse 36. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the city of which you say, it's given into the hand of the king of Babylon, by sword, by famine, and by pestilence. Behold, I will gather them from all the countries to which I drove them in my anger and my wrath, and my great indignation. He's talking to his people. I will bring them back to this place, and I will make them dwell in safety, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. You see how God sees things. He sees things in a much, much bigger span of time than we do. He's like, man, I'm going to bless future generations, generations yet to be born. Verse 40, I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts. They may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing them good. That's worth reading again, verse 41. Mm -hmm. I will rejoice in doing them good. And I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and with all my soul. For thus says the Lord, just as I have brought all this disaster upon my people, so I will bring upon all the good that I promised them. I love that. I will rejoice. God just doesn't do good things for us. He enjoys it. Yeah. God rejoices in doing good to you. And it says here at the end of verse 42, I will bring upon them all the good that I promised them. And 70 years later, God makes good on his promise. In a stunning, extraordinary way you never would have thought you could think of. I won't spoil the surprise. <laughs> Read Ezra chapter 1. Read it later tonight. That's what happens. But I'll close with this. In the here and now, Jesus answers all of God's promises for you with a resounding yes. And Amy mentioned it. You know, Ephesians 3.20. God gives us a license to dream. He can do more than we ask for. Or imagine, and God invites us to walk with Him, to dream with Him, to share our hopes with Him. Everything big, small, in between, old hopes, new hopes. God wants us to partner with Him, dream with Him, and find, just wait for creative ways where He's going to answer our prayers. And I really think that's one of the most exciting parts of our relationship with God. Don't miss out on that. So, all of our hopes for this lifetime will probably not come true. That's the reality. But many of them will. But if you're a Christian, you can know this for sure. Jesus is an ultimate hope. He is the ultimate hope that will never disappoint you. All of God's promises are answered yes in Jesus. You have a guaranteed hope of salvation, of resurrection, of eternal life. For those in Christ, one glorious day, we will be hopeless in heaven. And that's a good thing. <laughs> Faith becomes sight, hope becomes reality, and then there's only love. That's heaven. No eye is seen, no ear is heard, no mind is conceived of what God has in store for those who love Him. But in the meantime, hope will make you sick. <laughs> I think you'll remember that one. But it's true. It's proverbial wisdom. Hope will make you sick. But while you wait, I appeal to you it's what we're struggling with, what we're fighting through. It's hard for us. I appeal to you, keep praying. Get vulnerable. Keep on investing. You see, Jeremiah invested during the darkest of times. He invested in a future he would not see with his own eyes until he reached heaven. So let's all follow the example of Jeremiah. I dare you to hope. Because our best days as Christians, I believe they're right in front of us. 
Amen. Thank you.